several opportunities so that we can have your questions asked. So uh, again, thank you for joining us. You'll hear back from me in just a moment. But um, Terry, shall we go to, if for one last opportunity, if we could, I will just invite everyone who has just joined us. If you have not already typed it in, please type in your uh, name of your parish and whether or not you're considering a campaign. If you are, you can even type in the type of campaign that you are considering, because that will help us as we go through the rest of our webinar this evening. So Terry, I turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Jim. And welcome, all of you, to the basics of capital campaigns. Um, I am broadcasting live tonight from the diocesan headquarters for the Diocese of Chicago, where they are just about to take their capital campaign um, to the next phase. You will see behind me, over um, my shoulder, a hard hat. See how clear that is. Um, this was a major construction project for um, an $8 million capital campaign. So if you are feeling a little daunted, take heart. Much larger campaigns than yours have been successful. Um, and we will talk about some of the ways to do that tonight. What we will cover is um, a brief sort of overview of the many things that ECF does. Um, some of you have some experience with ECF already, but we cover a lot of territory. And we'd like to kind of give you a thumbnail sketch of that. We're going to look at um, the overview of a capital campaign process, um, which will include how to know if, in fact, you're already ready for a capital campaign, or do you have some work to do? And then whether or not you need a consultant, and if so, what are the things you want to consider in looking at a consultant? Now, if that's already raised some questions for you, um, go ahead, start typing them into the chat. We will have um, pause for questions in a little bit. But that, for the moment, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Jim Murphy to walk you through the mission of the Episcopal Church Foundation. Thank you, Terry. Um, so many of you who are logged in tonight have either been on webinars or have, or have dealt with the Episcopal Church Foundation. Um, so, but in a quick thumbnail sketch of what ECF does, ECF is a lay-led um, organization that solely serves the Episcopal Church. We are independent of a general convention and the church, but we solely serve um, the Episcopal Church in all of its parishes, dioceses, and related organizations. And in everything we do, we seek to empower leadership, both lay leadership as well as clergy leadership. Uh, we do that in two primary ways. First, through our um, leadership education, and many of you are already aware of our Vestry uh, resource guide, or for that matter, our recent um, but wonderful website called Vital Practices, ecfvp.org, and we'll be sending out a link to that to everyone who joins us here this evening. In addition, the Episcopal Church Foundation um, focuses as well on financial resource development. And for that, we do that in a number of different ways. We are the official resource for the entire Episcopal Church in the area of plant giving. And many of you may recognize my face or my voice from the various webinars that we've done on plan giving. Uh, in addition, we have an endowment management area where we can assist uh, your congregation in the creation of endowment and gift acceptance policies. We can also um, assist you in managing your endowment, if that's something that you need. We also can help your uh, diocese or parish in the area of annual giving and annual stewardship. Finally, we have a wonderful capital campaign area, which is the main focus of our webinar tonight, where we are able to work with a congregation or diocese throughout the church, all across the country, because we have geographically dispersed consultants and we can assign our particular consultants uh, to your congregation. We also um, are able to do this for you on a sliding fee scale, which I think Terry may mention very briefly later on. But we are able to help you during this very, very important time of your congregation's life 
and enable you to afford these types of services. So without further ado, I would like to turn the floor back to Terry, and I will go off camera. But please do. I will be monitoring the chat message. So if you do have questions throughout tonight's webinar, please feel free to type in your question. And uh, there will be several times for us to pause and to take those questions. So without further ado, Terry, please tell us about the basics of Capital Campaign. OK. I'm going to leave this uh, slide up here for just a tiny second longer because this is the mission statement for ECS. And we start with mission because the fundamental thing that you'll hear me repeat tonight is that mission attracts support. Um, so with that, how do you fund your mission? There, essentially, I'm going to give you sort of the 20-second overview of Fundraising 101. There are essentially three different ways to fund your mission. There is annual giving, which in the church we tend to call stewardship. There is capital giving which tends to be for extraordinary purposes, like capital um, improvements, paying off debt. Sometimes this gets used for seed money for new programs. The difference between capital giving and annual giving, fundamentally, is that your annual giving supports your operating budget on the institutional end. And on donor end, the annual giving tends to come out of um, cash flow, annual budget. We've got a new uh, person who's joined. I'm going to ask Julie to help us mute them while they're getting started. I, I, I just, I, I so muted good. them. Don't worry. We're all set. Okay. Um, it's important to think about the giving from the perspective of the donor as well as how it's going to serve you. So your annual giving tends to come from their cash flow. Capital giving can tend to come from accumulated assets, but it also can be a combination of accumulated assets and cash flow, sort of like the capital purchase of, say, a house or a car, where you've set aside some money for a down payment, and some of that giving comes out of people's ordinary income. Planned giving is both um, the most misunderstood and in some ways the growing to be the most important part of the giving structure in that um, in the past several years as regular philanthropic giving has increased in single digits, estate gifts have gone up double digits. So you want to know about your annual, your annual giving and your capital giving, but you also want to make sure that you're thinking about planned giving and keeping the opportunity in front of people to make a bequest or to put the church in their estate plans in some way. To do that, as I mentioned earlier when we were all chatting beforehand, you want to bear in mind that a gift at the end of life is going to be something that people understand as lasting beyond them. So there are some particular things that govern how you approach people about a, a planned gift and how you use that gift once you get it. So the three things that, um, and we will deal with these holistically. They're, they really don't untangle from each other. The thing we're going to focus on tonight is capital giving. But annual giving um, prepares you for a good, strong capital campaign. And a good, strong capital campaign and annual program should lead toward the kind of fiscal transparency and trust that encourages planned giving. So the fundraising process essentially is the same for all three of these kinds of giving. You want to identify the need, identify your potential donors, communicate the vision, all of that before you ask for support. Most of us think of fundraising as that fourth step, asking for support. And we miss that the most important part is what leads up to it, that part of the iceberg that's below the water. So we're going to spend a lot of time today on that part of the iceberg that's below the water. So that 
if you're wondering what you need to do to get ready, if you're wondering if you are ready, we're going to spend a lot of time on that. The other place that's significantly overlooked, I'm sorry to say, is saying thank you. Um, we tend to go from asking for support to right back to identifying more needs. So you want to be sure that you have thanked your donor um, as many times as you have stood up before them asking for support. You need to be saying thank you and showing them the impact their gift has given. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that as we go. Any capital campaign will um, come in three parts. Uh, at the Episcopal Church Foundation, we consider those three separate contract phases for reasons that are particular to parishes that, for instance, schools and hospitals don't have. The first phase we call discernment. And this is um, where you do the most important work. Remember I said mission attracts support. So this is where you are making sure that you are very, very clear about your vision and your mission. And in the church, we consider that there's someone besides the people in the room who are talking at this point. We believe that God is talking in terms of helping us define our mission and our vision. So this involves prayer. And as Episcopalians, we believe that God speaks to us through the assembled body of believers. So you're going to want to have quite a lot of involvement, bringing a lot of people on board for that. Um, notice how much, many more bullet points there are in discernment than there are in the feasibility study. That's because this is where you're bringing a lot of people on board doing a lot of planning, doing a lot of communicating back to other people about what's been done. And we'll break that down for you in a minute. How do you know when you're done? If there's all this involvement and planning and communicating, um, couldn't you just kind of stay there forever? Some people do. Um, so to make sure that you don't, the next phase we go to is the feasibility study. And that's the point at which you have gathered all your plans, you've done your level best to make sure absolutely everybody knows what's going on, and you've asked for their input. You put those plans, the cost of those plans, in front of people and ask for their level of support. And I'll walk you through what exactly a feasibility study looks like and the fact that not all feasibility studies are created equal. If your feasibility study indicates that you've done the necessary work for a capital campaign, then, and only then, do you get to the part of the campaign that most people are familiar with, which is the time when you go out and you invite people to contribute to a cause. And if you've done step one and step two well, then surprisingly, step three is the busiest but the easiest step of all, because you've already prepared the ground. People are on board. They've all agreed that this is an important thing to do. Um, if you are skeptical, you are in very good company. Almost every client we have uh, begins by thinking theirs will be a hard campaign. And at the end, they say, you know, this is really fun. So we will move you on to the next slide, um, which says, that we have time to talk to pause for questions. Um, I've seen a lot going on in the chat. Terry, uh, yes. Terry, yes, there is a question about visioning. Could you just say a little bit more about what it is um, for the novice within a congregation? I would be happy to. That is, in fact, my next slide. So if it's the only question, I'll go on to the next slide. It is. Slide. So why don't you go right ahead? Why don't you go right ahead? All right, that person gets a bonus point. Thank you. I already took um, the check. <laughs> right, just write your address in the um, chat and we'll send you that check. This, the essential question behind your vision is, what is God calling you to do or become? And then the next step is, what do you need to answer that call? Um, 
the best way to handle that in a mid-sized congregation is to gather your people in small groups. If you've got a small congregation, you can sometimes do this in a single group. Um, but a lot of people aren't comfortable speaking out in that you know, all parish group. You want to begin by asking people, what is it that we are here to do? What makes us unique in this little corner of the kingdom of God? And what do we need to carry that vision forward? Um, you want to be sure at this point that not only are you involving the wider congregation, but what we call stakeholders, um, people who are going to be using. For instance, if you feel that part of what you have to offer to the community is a beautiful music program, and that is part of your mission and vision, then you're going to want to involve the choir and the musicians in a particular way. If you are um, strong in the educational front, you are going to want all your Christian education people involved there. Um, the nightmare scenario is the kitchen. Um, if you've got to upgrade the kitchen because you're a place of hospitality, you've got to get all those people who use the kitchen together, talk about what they need, how they see this operating. And you want to be sure that the people who can fund this are intimately involved on the front end. Now, it's really important right now that you're not talking about just a list of things that you want, but things that are connected to who you are and what difference you make in the community. Now, if you're lucky, and actually looking at the chat, it looks like this group very much did come to the table with a lot of those needs already identified. I saw parking was lot. Um, I saw uh, additional building. I saw signs. So there were quite a few of you who came already knowing that you've got some um, capital projects that really are kind of bricks and mortar projects. Um, we do also sometimes see capital campaigns for seed money for programs so that as a congregation grows, that um, program cost is absorbed into the annual operating budget. Lots of people um, after the market crash were paying off debt, and um, there are ways to do that. Although I didn't see anybody say anything about debt retirement. If you are trying to pay off debt with your capital campaign, maybe raise your hand or type that into the chat. And then occasionally, we have people who do um, capital campaigns for, to build endowment, or who make endowment um, an integral part of their capital campaign. And a really good way to do that is through um, integrating planned giving into your capital campaign. Now, to be truly successful, as I said, you want to make sure that those goals are connected to your mission. What are you called to do? How will these projects help you do that more faithfully? Um, an example of this is a small congregation that I worked with outside Chicago where um, they felt that they needed, they were a multi-story congregation and they had several uh, wheelchair users as part of their, their membership. So they really were beginning to feel tugged to make the building more accessible. But it was a tiny minority of the entire congregation who really needed that accessibility. So they had to have a long discussion about why they might be spending all this money for what looked like maybe just a fraction of the congregation. And as they had that, that discussion, one of the things that arose was their sense of themselves, their mission in the community was to be extraordinarily welcoming. At which point, there was this sort of aha in the entire congregation. And they said, well, we can't really be welcoming if as soon as you come in the front door, everybody else can go upstairs and downstairs, but you're stuck on a single level. And at that point, it, not, it became a campaign to include the community rather than a campaign 
to fund a project needed by one or two people in the congregation. So it was understood as part of their mission in the community, and that led to an extremely successful capital campaign. Which brings me, as I said, to that next part, which is involving people, your leaders and your stakeholders. You form those committees. Um, you want to have an overall sort of discernment committee. In the best possible world, you want that committee to rec uh, represent the various constituencies within your congregation. Do you have a lot of snowbirds or a lot of summer people? Do you have um, a growing young families group? Do you have a lot of retirees on fixed income? You want to make sure that everybody who has a distinctive voice is included. Um, you have small group and parish meetings to discuss where you're headed as a congregation, how these projects will contribute to that. You will also probably have to have some individual meetings with people who um, really ought to be brought on board early on, the people who can actually make your financial plans a reality. And then this is the period when you're checking with professionals. Do you need um, some zoning waivers? Do you need to talk to the city manager? Do you need an architect in there? Um, if you're paying down debt, you want to talk to the bankers. Can you get your uh, mortgage refinanced? That kind of thing. Now this seems like a lot of work, and it is. And a lot of people are nervous early on because it seems so big and so amorphous. But it's critical to the success of the next phase. While this is going on, you want to be sure that everything you learn is being communicated back to the congregation. So you're creating kind of a feedback loop. You ask people to give you their opinions. You report back to the larger congregation what those opinions are. You use that information to pull together plans, get those plans um, associated with some costs, and then run those um, plans by the vestry for approval and, I would say, also by the congregation at large one last time before you change uh, to go to your feasibility study. The reason for this is a little bit complicated. Um, congregations function like families, and we all know of times in our family when we felt that we knew exactly what we wanted, but then when we got down to the wire, what looked like a really great idea, in fact, in reality, was not exactly what we wanted. My classic example of this is a congregation that was renovating and really wanted um, their sanctuary structure to include an entrance um, that they could access from inside. Again, it was in a very cold climate. They said every time it snows, the brides have to go out through the snow in order to come down the center aisle for their wedding. So we'd like to change that. And after a couple of different tries, the architect solution that would fit their budget was to take the altar from the um, traditional spot and move it to the side wall. And then this little side entrance became the back entrance. And there you had a nice center aisle that came in through the parish hall, and everything was solved. Now, yes, everything was solved, I'm sure, Terry. <laughs> I was going to say, raise your hand if you think that went really well. <laughs> so when they ran the plans in front of the congregation, um, everyone said, no, no, no. They loved their traditional architecture. They would prefer to keep that. And um, they had to completely revamp. Nevertheless, the congregation felt listened to. They supported the campaign as it was restructured. And they've gone on to have two very successful capital campaigns as well. Now I'm seeing some questions. This might be a good time to pause before transitioning to um, feasibility. Let me see. Yeah, I put up a couple for you, uh, Terry. Um, one, the third one from Greg is actually something I think uh, you just intimated that perhaps the only type of capital campaign you want to have is a successful one. Do you want to make any comment on that? And then, of course, Ross's question has been seconded by someone else. And so that may be a, something you want to save until a little later to answer. 
Okay, okay, Ralph, I'll get to your question. I do see it up here. Um, uh, Greg has said that they had a sales campaign three year, years ago, and people are very wary. And actually, this is a great time, Greg, to talk about that, because um, the two things that you can do to, well, three things, to exercise the ghost of your previous campaign, one is to have a very transparent, clear, and thorough process at the beginning. So you want that discernment process to be extremely inclusive, extremely on the table about the fact we know that our previous campaign only raised X amount or only accomplished this much. You want to try to stay away from saying it failed, but say our previous campaign did this, it did it for these reasons, so we are taking these steps to make sure that this campaign accomplishes everything we want it to do. So be very transparent, very on the table, very inclusive, and then be sure you do a really thorough feasibility study, which is our next step. Because the feasibility study, a really good feasibility study, is your fail safe against a failed campaign. A good feasibility study will tell you exactly how much you can raise. It will measure how much people know about the campaign. Um, typically, parish leadership is working really hard on this. You know what the campaign is about. But the average person in the pew may not be paying quite as much attention. And so you want to check to make sure they really know what's going on. Are they supportive of it? I've sat down to do feasibility study interviews with um, vestry members who said, oh, yes, we know what the campaign's about, but no, we don't support it. The rector wants it. That's a really good time to call a halt before the rector and his leadership are at odds over real money during a capital campaign. Um, we, a good feasibility study will identify people who will work on that campaign because you need volunteers to run it. And if you've got multiple uh, projects, as I see one of the questions asked about, a good feasibility study will ask people to prioritize those projects so that if you can only fund some of them, the group as a whole has spoken about what's most important. And then um, a good feasibility study will weigh intangible such as um, your tolerance for debt, are there other campaigns in the area that might be affecting your campaign? Huge, huge during the market crash was what we call um, economic optimism. People may have been just as financially secure, but they were also financially nervous, and so they were less willing to give. So we measure some of those intangibles as well. So, when we get to the part where we're talking about consultants, one of the things you want to be very sure of is you ask very specific questions about what a feasibility study will deliver. This is the area with the most um, variability in deliverables, as we call it, in the industry. You can get a wide range of different things in your feasibility study. So you want to make sure that you get a, a quantitative measure of how many people know about your campaign, how many people support your campaign, if they have reservations, what are those reservations. You want a feasibility study that gives you a specific goal that you can raise, a monetary amount, um, identifies your volunteers, identifies projects, and then helps you with some of those intangibles, like how many other philanthropic projects are in front of your particular donors things like that. Um, a feasibility study with ECF takes about three months. We will design and print that tentative case statement that I talked about. We'll do some personal interviews. I sort of imply that, talking about vestry members who were not in support of um, the rector. But we will also send out surveys, either electronically by, or by mail. And that's one of those things that um, is particular to parishes that you want to think about. A lot of feasibility studies, um, I came from a secular fundraising background before joining ECF. 
And a lot of feasibility studies will focus on those major donors and just do the major donor interviews. But a parish community um, is kind of a closed community. We have those, we have our grapevines, and we talk to each other. So by surveying everybody, you bring that whole community together, and that printed um, report that you get at the end records absolutely everybody's comments. So you see it right there, whether you've got a tiny minority in favor of something, but they're just fully vocal, or do you have a broad support for a project? Um, by the time we have analyzed and compiled all that information, it takes about six weeks after those initial interviews and the time that the survey goes out, we'll come back and make a report in person or over the phone. You get um, your full report both as an electronic document and um, print it up if you like. Um, kills a lot of trees, but we still do it if you need it. And um, our clients meet or exceed their goals 92% of the time. And once on one of these webinars, somebody asked, so what happened to the other 8%? And in my career, I have had a capital campaign chair die, um, another one um, suffer a mental breakdown, you know, really pretty unavoidable things. If you've got a good feasibility study, you can rest easy. You will still have some emotional pushback um, if you've got that ghost of a bad campaign in your past. When you get to the actual um, solicitation phase, that's a really emotionally intense time for people with real money on the table. And so you'll still get a little more pushback. Stay strong. Um, stay the course. Remember, everyone has agreed that this is important and this is vital to your mission. Not about the money. It's about your mission. And Terry, uh, I think some. And Terry, I think something that um, really is important from the feasibility study is it will show um, those projects which can be funded and funded successfully. And I think, in some ways, that answers some of what Ross is uh, asking in his question about raising monies for particular needs and then also having a a capital fund as well, because it is a problem if um, there are needs that uh, people don't want to fund. And that's a big part of the test of the feasibility study. Yes, the feasibility study actually, um, and you, this is another thing to ask when you start interviewing consultants, is sort of how they prioritize the project. We use a formula. Um, we ask people to rank the projects, and then we use a formula to weight that ranking. And at, when your feasibility study report is presented, we actually show you the formula, walk you through the math for each project, and you can see how each project stacks up. The other thing I would add is if you're trying to accumulate a reserve fund, and you're not having luck in a, a straight out capital campaign, then this is a project for your planned giving campaign. Overwhelmingly, endowments are generated by planned gifts. And if you're not folding that into your capital campaign, you are literally losing money. So um, to learn more about that, go to EpiscopalFoundation.org and click on Events and sign up for one of the planned giving uh, webinars. We won't cover that in detail tonight. Just know that the best way to accumulate uh, long-term assets is through planned giving. When your, capital, when your feasibility study comes back, if it's strong and it says you've got support for a capital campaign, you've got the lead gifts necessary, you've got the volunteers, then you are up and ready to go. Now, I see one of the... Um, Future questions is what to do about debt. Um, this is kind of a good time to start folding that in because a big part of what you are doing is developing your case for support. Now remember, you have um, been attaching that support case for support to your um, mission all along. So you're not starting from scratch here. You're in good shape. But that will be 
part of your planning process. Then the capital campaign itself um, operates in two phases. What we call the advanced gifts phase, which if you've done, um, you know, experienced a capital campaign, say through your school or um, the local Boy Scouts, there's that silent phase. Um, then you have a big event in which you announce that the capital campaign is launched and, oh my goodness, you've already raised X amount. That moves you into the congregational gift phase or um, the public phase of a capital campaign. Do not overlook the last bullet point, that celebration and thanks. Remember, I said you want to spend as much time thanking people as um, you spent asking them for money. Now, along the way, in this planning process, um, ECF will provide you with your capital campaign brochures, professionally designed, also with um, a user updatable uh, website that will help you track the capital campaign. Um, this is where you will talk about, for instance, if you're raising money to pay off debt, what are the things that you can do if you are not spending that money on debt service? If that debt service money were liberated from the banks and put to use for God's mission, what would that look like? That's going to be your focus if you are paying off debt. And when you have, you will have arrived at that point which was marked in Exodus when Moses actually had to tell people to stop bringing resources. They had enough to complete the job. This is the first successful capital campaign in biblical history. So we've got another moment for questions. I see one up here about timing. Is summertime a good or bad time to do a feasibility study? And that Actually, both are timing questions. Both are timing questions. Yes, let's see. What's the other one? Um, oh, the vestry is very clear that the roof must be done this summer. She's already found the contractor. Um, that's going to be, OK, that's going to be a timing problem just because it's going to be, unless you're a very, very small congregation. Um, the question, let me read that to all of you. Um, what do you do if you need to push the timeline? Um, this is a parish where they really feel like they need to have the roof redone in the summer. And you know, I can see the logic behind that. And they've got the contractor, but they haven't really done the prep work. Sometimes you do have to put your finger in the dike. Um, if you are a small congregation, they move quickly. And it may be possible to process the need uh, through the entire congregation with an all-parish meeting. You need to be really prepared. You need to um, have all your ducks in a row, you know, be very transparent financially, and um, then you need to be prepared to move quickly through the feasibility study phase. Um, the other question was about feasibility being done in the summer. And actually, that depends entirely on your parish uh, culture. There are congregations where that's actually when you should do it, because you have a big summer population. There are other congregations where everybody goes away during the summer, and it's pointless. You're not going to get the level of response that you need, so your feasibility study will be worthless. So um, if you're in the middle and people pretty much stay and your attendance is pretty steady throughout the summer, it's probably fine. You do want to make sure that you are really strategic about talking to your major donors so that if they're away during the summer, you call them up and get the interviews by phone or some other way, but you need to be sure they're included or again, your feasibility study will not accurately reflect the ability to raise funds there in your congregation. So I'm going to move right on, um, but we will have a little more time for questions. Um, do you need a consultant? Well, technically, I have known congregations um, that have raised money very successfully without um, a consultant. 
So it can be done. It is also true that people lift cars. People perform surgery on their, themselves um, during great duress. But you don't necessarily have to put yourself through that. It's worth considering some consultants as part of the process of deciding whether or not your congregation needs a consultant. The advantages are that the rectors and wardens stay focused on running the parish. A good consultant does as many con uh, campaigns in a year as the average human being will experience in a lifetime, certainly the average rector. Um, so that sets you up nicely in terms of making sure you've done all those prep steps that we were talking about earlier. Um, that depth and breadth of experience um, will also give you a level of neutrality in decision making that um, you know the decisions your consultant makes will be based on experience rather than um, the sense of urgency or need or, let's be frank, personalities are very strong in some congregations and those take over. Um, while we're being frank, let's talk about accountability. You can fire a consultant. They do this for a living. They, it's in their best interest to make sure that you get the best service possible. It helps keep your campaign on time. Um, on budget and accountable to the vestry. Because of these things, you tend to get better performance. Uh, campaigns that are over or managed by consultants tend to raise higher amounts of money. Also because of that breadth of experience, um, you're going to be more likely to avoid some of those ethical problems that congregations run into. Overwhelmingly, congregations mean to do the right thing, and if they get into an ethical dilemma, it's because they couldn't see three or four steps down the field, and they didn't know the consequences of the decision that they were making at the time. So a consultant can keep you out of ethical trouble, out of timeliness trouble, um, keep you from making some of the more common mistakes, and they take all that parish gossip home with them in the trunk of their car or on the airplane and get that parking lot conversation out of your parking lot. Now, why ECF? As I mentioned earlier, um, I came to ECF from a secular fundraising background. And I confess that early on, I was a little um, skeptical. I thought good fundraising is good fundraising. Um, but there are things that are particular to congregations. And over the years, I have cleaned up after many a secular firm that did not know, for instance, that you have to get permission of the diocese to encumber your property, that you, um, it's the vestry, not the rector, who has the fiduciary responsibility for a congregation, that kind of thing. We've had over 25 years of success and um, experience that we bring to our work. And because we have consultants all over the country, you have instant access to an entire network of congregations. So one of the questions we often send out among our consultants is, who's working on such and such? I have a client who wants to know x, y, z. Um, as you saw at the beginning, we implement the fundraising holistically. We consider your annual giving as well as your planned giving as part of your capital campaign. And all of that we see as a manifestation and extension of your spiritual life, your mission, and the reason that God has put you in the little corner of his kingdom that you find yourself. Um, finally, because we are a nonprofit rather than a proprietary firm, we operate on a sliding fee scale based on your operating budget. So we can um, serve all kinds of congregations regardless of their size. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of resources while I answer a few more questions. Um, you'll see here on our website, there are some places that you can get brochures to take back to your leadership about um, preparing for a capital campaign, ways that you can, steps you can take to get ready for that. 
and then some sample client brochures and um, client lists and related reading. And speaking of related reading, these are my two favorite um, recommendations for things that you might want to take back to your vestry and stewardship committee. The Spirituality of Fundraising by Henry Nowen, which you can get at the Nowen um, Society website there. And then Not Your Parents' Offering Plate, which has a rather unlikely title, but it's a really slim, readable volume. It's excellent. You can get it through bookstores and Amazon. Now I see a few more questions up here. Um, oh, there. how much are consultants? Um, yes, uh, Donna, the question of how much a consultant costs is really open-ended. If you are interested in exploring a consultant, what I would recommend is that you um, look for a range. You'll find a lot of sort of mom and pop shops who've just hung out a shingle. They will tend to um, have the lowest overhead, so they tend to have the lowest fees on the front end. In that case, what you want to do is be very careful, careful, careful about asking about your deliverable. What exactly will you get for that fee? Will they cover stewardship? What does the uh, feasibility study include? Will they help you do the preparatory phase, the discernment level phase? That kind of thing. On the other end of the spectrum, there are big proprietary firms like Campbell and Company, um, CCS. They are worth looking at for other reasons, especially if you are a large congregation. They tend to be a little bit outside your price range if you are a mid to small congregation. And I tend to think that ECF fits um, from a budgetary uh, perspective somewhere in the middle. So I would interview at least three people and three firms, and that will begin to give you um, a range. But the, the price is very wild. Barry, we have um, yes. Yes. Um, thank you for that. Um, there's a, the, the, one of the questions that's up about what is impactful, what stirs people's hearts and, and gets them moving. Uh, one thing that Ross has put forward is that possibly a very effective PowerPoint slideshow can be effective. Um, what are, in your opinion, are some of the most effective methods to deliver, to deliver the message to your congregation when it comes to a capital campaign? One of the reasons a slideshow or PowerPoint is so effective is because it uses images, often they use music, it connects to the emotions. Um, giving it, while you need to be extremely transparent um, and clear about your financial management and your goals, that final decision to give is an emotional one. So that's one of the reasons that you're connecting to your mission. That's one of the reasons those slideshows work so well. But they don't work unless somebody closes the deal. I bet you've never turned off the, the slideshow and had a rush to the front with everybody to write their check. You still have to send someone out to say, I'd like to ask you to participate as well. Um, and the word impact is important here because the church and society as a whole is experiencing a philanthropic shift. Um, those born before 1945 are thought of as um, what, philanthropically, what is philanthropically called the traditionalists. They give out of a sense of duty, and they trust institutions. They look for the uh, furtherance of institutional life. The baby boomers born after 45 tend to look for impact. What difference is this going to make? Um, I call this the Heifer effect. Um, they talk about the Heifer International talks about $500 buys a cow, and then they tell you how that cow changes the economy of a village. Another one of our consultants calls it the NPR approach. 
you know how every time National Public Radio has one of their pledge drives, they say, this, your gift makes this program possible. That kind of impact makes all the difference. Um, I have a question about saying a little bit more about retiring debt. Um, is it possible? What are the challenges? Um, it is more challenging in a way because, let's face it, the first thing that you think of when um, somebody mentions retiring a debt is that maybe you have a few debts of your own. So it automatically moves people back away from that emotional experience I was just talking about and into that very left brain, scarcity cautious place where there it's much, much harder to inspire people. And donors want to be inspired. As I said earlier, probably your best approach to retiring debt is to look at what you could accomplish with the debt service if you didn't have to give it to the bank. And of course, nobody likes to send money to someone else's bank. Nobody likes to be paying off the loan. So talk about what would be possible. And I just finished a diocesan campaign where that was entirely the point, was what kind of ministry could we do in this diocese if we didn't have this mortgage? Now, oh, I, this is a great question. I love when I get this question. Greg has asked, what about sources of um, funding outside the congregation, uh, grants, crowdfunding, that sort of thing? Yes, you should absolutely look outside your congregation. If for no other reason, then it gives you the opportunity to share your mission outside the doors of your church. And we don't do that nearly enough. So you should absolutely be looking. There are very, very few foundations that will make grants to parishes, but there are a few. Um, and let's see, in $27 million worth of capital campaigns for Episcopal organizations, I have seen less than 100,000 come from outside the organization. And that's aggregate. That's not a single organization. But total fundraising I've done is brought in 27 million. And out of that, maybe 100,000 has come from outside the organization. So you should do it. It's icing on the cake. Um, but it tends not to be a game changer because those donors were not involved in that missional discussion that you had back, remember, during the discernment phase. So we have five minutes left. Um, I'd like to let you know about some upcoming webinars and get, take one more um, pause for questions. Do we have any more, Jim? We actually don't have any questions, but I would invite everyone out there, um, if you do have a question, why don't you type it into chat right now. And as I uh, wrap up this section and we go back to um, our closing, you can certainly ask Terry that question. Just to wrap up this um, section, we found that these webinars that we're doing um, are very impactful. And so we have been recording them, much like we are tonight. And, and we are more than happy to share all of those that we have recorded with you. They focus on a number of areas. And you can see them on your screen. In addition to that, though, we have some wonderful webinars coming up. Um, in fact, next Tuesday, it's seemingly that we're always doing these on a Tuesday, um, aren't we, Terry? Uh, we'll be having a wonderful webinar on the annual stewardship subject calling Making the Case for Your Parish. Now, if you've checked it out online, that's not the title we gave it online. The title online we gave it was Why Should I Give Money to You? And um, this is an important shift, if you will, that we're feeling in the church. And if you haven't felt it, you, you will eventually. You need to be that's able that. to prove. Go ahead, Terry. No, I was going to say, that's that shift I was talking about from the traditionalist to the new philanthropist. And you need to be able to prove that. And so we're going to uh, have the opportunity to have Charles Wilson from the Diocese of New Hampshire uh, lead this workshop next Tuesday. Um, for those of you out there that may be diocesan administrators, diocesan executives, or bishops, 
um, you are invited to a special webinar that Terry will be hosting in the middle of the day on May 1st, focusing on major donors and the importance of planning uh, a campaign for major donors, because that is somewhat different at the diocesan level. Finally, we are very proud to say that for the first time, we will have our first stewardship webinar in Espanol. Uh, we have had other webinars in Spanish in the past. This will be our first stewardship webinar, and we are very, very excited about it. And what I will encourage everyone out there um, that if you would like, you can certainly invite um, anyone that you know who is in a Spanish-speaking congregation that um, they are more than welcome. All of these webinars are free, and um, you are welcome to have others attend. So I believe I've successfully put back the question screen. This was a uh, technical <laughs> marvel, shall we say. Um, yes. Were there any questions that came in in that uh, brief period, Terry, that you wanted to address? Um, well, actually, one is a little bit complicated. Um, Sarah felt asked how um, the uh, consultant helped you identify sources of funding. And then there was a follow-up about the um, Charles LaFond webinar, which um, may already be full. So I, what I'm going to do is, Sarah, if you'll type, um, I believe we have your email address because we had yeah. to use it to send you the link, I will answer your question offline. Um, I will send an email with that. It's a little bit complicated, and we just have one minute left. But I do want to let everybody know that um, whenever you encounter a webinar that is uh, full, you should still send us your email and request a link. We will send you the recording just as we begin recording this webinar at the beginning. We're happy to share those um, recordings. And if anyone else wants to know how consultants go about identifying sources of funding, uh, feel free to email me. My email address is right there. And I'll just send a group email to anyone who has a question there. And Thank you, um, all. One, other, uh, one other question that did come up, Terry, and we can't uh, address it individually here, is the cost of our consultants uh, for doing a capital campaign. And let me just say that it is on a sliding fee scale based upon your budget. And this is how we're um, able to make this affordable to almost all parishes all throughout the country. So if you do have an interest in this, um, Terry or Luis Vallejo, who is our other program director in the area of capital campaign, would be more than happy to speak with you on this topic. And uh, Terry, thank you so much once again for doing this. Terry is, this is not a fake set. She is literally in the uh, contractor's office at the, the uh, reconstruction that's going on at the Diocese of Chicago. So that hard hat is a real thing. It's not a prop. Hey, uh, okay. So thank you. Thank you, Terry, so much uh, today. Thank you, Julie Vital, who has served as our background technical assistant uh, tonight. Thank you all uh, for attending this evening. It's been wonderful to have you here. We will be sending out copies of the PowerPoint presentation, uh, as well as many other resources for your use, um, including a recording of this webinar. So thank you all for coming this evening. And we wish you all the best in your endeavors. And if there is anything that the Episcopal Church Foundation can assist you in, in any of these areas of resource development, we are more than happy to assist. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, God bless. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you very much.